impact and transform. That is what incredible leaders do. Welcome to the Virginia State University College of Agriculture podcast, where we talk about the unique way that leaders transform environments. I am your host, Jewel Brenau, and today we have our 15th USDA Deputy Secretary, Sochil Torres Small. Thank you so much for joining today. We are delighted to have you here. And um, I just want to say to you, thank you for the time that you've spent here at Virginia State University. I understand that you were here yesterday with your MLK Day of Service here out at Randolph Farm. You have rejoined us today and spent the entire day here uh, touring our agricultural facilities and we'll be meeting with our students. So we just say welcome and we're delighted to have you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenna. It is an honor to be here with the 14th Deputy Secretary of USDA. I'm so grateful to get to follow in your footsteps there and to get to be here at BSU with you. Absolutely. I'm just so happy that we have our students here uh, today. Uh, it's really important as we talk about transformational leaders to talk about the personal side of leadership. Um, you think about uh, us and where we've come, and we'll, we'll talk about that. You, you think about folks who one day may want to become a deputy secretary of the United States Department of Agriculture or the secretary or whatever career you have. When you think about leadership and the steps towards leadership, there's no perfect journey. And I think for us in this podcast, it's incredible to show leadership, what leaders look like. There's no one shape, form, background that's the best. We're all different. So I hope that we can get to know you today. And that's what we're here for. So welcome again. Uh, we're delighted to have you here. You have such an incredible background as your bio states, just thinking about your leadership as an undersecretary um, for the rural development mission at USDA and your ability to be able to get uh, $2 billion or more from the bipartisan infrastructure law under your leadership on the ground to really help rural communities uh, in terms of the infrastructure needs uh, that you led. We thank you for your leadership and all of your investment, your work in Congress and all of that skill set that you bring to this job, this incredible job as the chief operating officer of the United States Department of Agriculture, which is one of the largest federal government departments uh, and 100,000 plus more employees. So you do not have an easy job, but we're delighted to have you here. So let, let's just go back a little bit. Um, you hail from New Mexico. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Tell us where you're from, um, just a, a little bit about your background and how you've just come to where you are today. I grew up in the Mesilla Valley in Las Cruces, New Mexico. It's a rich agricultural valley full of pecans and chile and onions and cotton. Uh, my grandparents on my dad's side immigrated from Mexico picking cotton. Uh, my mom grew up all around the country. She's a daughter of a minister and came to uh, NMSU, New Mexico State University, where she met my dad, another land-grant institution. And uh, so I had the chance to grow up in an incredible community. Uh, and it's, it's where I still call home today, even though I'm living in D.C. right now. My husband and my horses and uh, dogs and cat are, are back home in Las Cruces. Oh, awesome. All the way from New Mexico. Do you have a favorite food? Oh, wow. A very specific favorite food. Okay. Uh, so every Thanksgiving, my dad smokes a turkey with mesquite, which is, uh, mm -hmm. it grows all across southern New Mexico. And so the day after Thanksgiving, you know, we, we take the leftovers and we make green chile enchiladas. And that, that is my favorite food. Green chilies. Yeah. I learned about that when I visited <laughs> New Mexico. That, that's amazing. Well, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you back just a little step further. And I want to thank you for submitting this, these photos. If, if we could put up <laughs> photos of the deputy secretary when she was <laughs> little, you are absolutely adorable. And it's, I just love these pictures because it, it shows your, it, I'm assuming that's your dad and your mom, how they're, they're just so proud of you and they're doting over you. Um, and, I, and I think about these pictures, uh, why they're so important. I think the message here is, you think about who you were when you were young. Uh, you have no idea at this age what life has in store for you, the journey that you're going to go on. And I, I think for the students who are here, 
you know, think about yourselves as a young person um, and who you kind of felt that you were. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, just so you didn't feel alone, I put myself out there. And if you all would just put up the next picture, I've embarrassed myself all the way. And I put my second grade picture. Those are not Beats headphones on my ears. That's my hair, actually. Um, thinking about uh, two deputy secretaries, the first African-American woman, the first Latina woman, serving under Secretary Vilsack's administration. Um, that's amazing. I don't know if we, thinking about these pictures, would have thought this would be a, a part of our journey. But who did, when you think about these pictures and yourself when you were young, how did you perceive your young self? Well, I when I think about um, growing up, the the thing that I think both of these pictures really show is I just had incre have incredibly dedicated and wonderful parents. And you know, you can grow up with all sorts of challenges or struggles, um, but I I had the incredible blessing of growing up always knowing I was loved, and that gave me an awareness of community, an awareness of just the impact that that can have on on a person's life. And uh, it also gave me an incredible pride and gratitude for my home, um, which which I think was a big reason, was really the only reason I, I chose to end up uh, serving in Congress to represent my home, uh, was just that that recognition that there's no place like home. Amazing. And what how would you describe your personality? when you were a kid in elementary school? Ah, huh. uh, you know, I mean, I think um, I, I think my mom would say I was like, I was always performing. I, I would dance everywhere. Um, I was also pretty independent. Uh, she would always have games that she wanted me to play and I'd say, no, no, no I'm doing my own thing. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I think the other thing this picture shows is we just loved being outside. Uh, you can run, you can yeah. explore, and out in the West, it's just uh, really easy to uh, create your own adventures. Well, a little known fact that I learned this morning when you were talking with President Abdullah, our deputy secretary is a former drum major. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I mean, VSU is uh, setting a whole new standard for drum majors that I'm sure uh, I, I would not meet. But, uh, it, man, I loved marching band in high school. I loved getting the chance to have a team and an identity, um, that we were all part of something bigger than ourselves, that the little steps on the field were, were creating these incredible images and supporting um, you know, our school spirit. I was also a Trojan. Mayfield is a Trojan uh, mascot right. as well as BSU. So there you go. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, incredible. Uh, just thinking about your background, you are the, the grandchild of uh, farm workers. And USDA has uh, really done a lot in terms of thinking about advocacy for farm workers. How did that impact you uh, or your experience growing up? Well, first, I'll, I'll talk about how it impacts me now. And, uh, you know, Dr. Bernal, you were so fundamental in setting up the Equity Commission. And I remember hearing from Co-Chair Rodriguez, uh, the former head of um, the, the Farm Worker uh, Union UFW, um, and when he came for his first equity commission meeting, it was the first time he'd stepped inside the Department of Agriculture. And to think about being the granddaughter of a woman whose vocation was picking cotton, um, but also always tended a garden at home and always saw the healing uh, of agriculture as well. Uh, and to think about now how I'm working with Secretary Vildsack to invest in small and mid-sized farms as well as our entire farming economy and making sure that there is a voice for farm workers uh, in the future of agriculture and recognizing that all of our future is incumbent upon this next generation of agriculture uh, being a place where people can thrive. Uh, it's just an exceptional, it's, it's grounding for that work uh, to know that I would not be here if it weren't for my grandma. My Nana. That's amazing. And I, I think you just remind us, we think about our backgrounds as African-Americans at this 1890 university. And I think about the, the similar background, your history uh, in your culture. It's, it's very similar. And so I think it's the importance of advocating for people who have not had a voice for themselves. And we appreciate your leadership and your uh, what you bring to the table in terms of doing that. 
as I, as I pivot a little bit, um, and I want everyone who's viewing to think about this as well. We're all born with like something special, a natural skill, a natural talent that we have um, that ju it's just God given. And I, I call it uh, your superpower. That thing that you learned maybe when you were in elementary school was something you were really, really good at. And you use those same gifts today in your job or wherever you are. So what would you consider to be one or two of your superpowers? You are indeed superwoman. What are, what are a couple of your superpowers that you have and you use them as a leader? Well, I'll start with, with something that maybe you'll push back and say it's not a superpower, but I'm going to say it anyway. So All right, <laughs> say it. Uh, you know, I mean, so often you think about, about Superman, for example, and sometimes it's a double-edged sword. Your superpower is also your kryptonite. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm always very aware of what I don't know, of not being the expert in the room and getting to do this job, you know, relatively early on in my career. I'm, I'm aware that I'm working with people at USDA who have been in agriculture for longer than I've been alive. And for me, the superpower is recognizing that and acknowledging that you can be a leader who builds a great team, who uh, partners with experts, asks the right questions, uh, finds, explores the opportunities, uh, rather than... Uh, knowing everything all the time. And and I've seen that. It, it, for me, it's been an incredible opportunity to build a team at USDA uh, that is, um, that deeply recognizes the the great expertise, particularly of career uh, civil servants mm -hmm. who've been at USDA, administration in and administration out, uh, maintaining a focus on agriculture and nutrition and forestry. And you've made some really good points because... Um... There is no playbook for being a deputy secretary of a large federal government department. There's not one. Um, you don't know everything as a leader all the time. And it's okay to not know. Actually, sometimes it's beneficial to admit that you don't know um, because often your team wants to be there to be a part of the solution. Um, and so I think that's an incredible superpower. Um, and and you are a person who listens. I, I want to talk about words that describe you. This is this is just from from my interaction with you, um, and and these are are some of what I consider to be your superpowers. Uh, you're certainly energetic. You 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 bring an energy and a light to a place that you go to the room. Um, you you have incredible energy. Um, super gracious. Uh, you, you come into a room, you light the room up, but but you don't take it over with trying to be the biggest, the loudest. Um, I think that's incredible. You are uh, a great listener um, and you, you ask questions. And the reason I think that you ask questions is because you're very solutions oriented. You get things done. And I think that's incredibly effective as a leader to, to listen and to really listen to what people have to say and then figure out the way to make sure that you get it right, get the solution right. Um, and, and you're very, very compassionate. Um, those are things that I have just observed about, about you. I think those are a lot of your strengths and super smart that you bring that make you very effective in your leadership. So those are some superpowers that I have. makes her cry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's real. And, um, you know, we think about the transformational leadership. We all have those things. We all have those things that we use to transform environments as leaders. And like you said, we, we have some shortcomings as well. Um, and so with those shortcomings, you talked about building that team around you. That's really, really important in terms of leadership, because it's not about us individually. You know, it's all about the, the, the greater good. Well, you have come here for a purpose, and um, we're so excited for you to be kicking off your 1890 university tour right here at Virginia State University. And um, we have been so fortunate with the Biden-Harris administration um, and with Congress in affording $262.5 million through the Inflation Reduction Act to cultivate the next generation of diverse 
food and agriculture leaders. And by and large, those leaders, those leaders are at the Virginia State Universities, the 1890 universities, but also the other minority serving institutions, the Hispanic serving institutions, the tribal colleges and universities and others. And you're starting this effort uh, right here. Tell us a little bit about um, that next gen effort of USDA and kind of what you plan for the next stages of your tour. What do you want to accomplish with your tour? Well, I'll, I'll start uh, just a little bit about Secretary Vilsack's whiteboard speech and his vision for uh, the future of agriculture, uh, recognizing that it's grounded in a space that most of the students uh, at a time before most of the students were alive. But in, in 1981, uh, there was the, the United States decided we've got a crisis in terms of being able to produce enough. Are we going to be able to grow enough for the for people in our across the United States? And so there was a effort to grow uh, uh, from fence row to fence row and be as efficient and as effective as possible. And farmers answered that call. So you'll see now that uh, farming is most supported at a large efficiency commodity stage because farmers have answered that call to produce as much as possible so that we're not only feeding our whole country, we're feeding the world. But what we've seen in the midst of COVID, what we've seen in the wake of climate change is that we don't just need to be efficient, we also need to be resilient. And farmers, particularly uh, black farmers and minority farmers, have been carving out other solutions as well to be resilient, to create local and regional food systems, to add value to their crops so that they can be smaller and still thrive. But uh, our policy hasn't always kept up with that. And that's why from 1981 to now, the United States has lost over 437,000 farms. Wow. The United States has lost more, um, more than uh, 141 million acres mm -hmm. of farm. And so when we look at the future that students at VSU and beyond will be stepping into, there's a need to find ways to invest in farming in different ways and adding value to your crop and adding practices to your farming that will also help fight climate change in creating new markets. And that's what my tour at BS, BSU has been so exciting to see, is to see how they're looking at what are the nutrients that are coming from ginger, for example, and how can we get a really high value out of that agriculture? Or if we're looking at high tunnels, how can we extend that production for that small area of land so the farmer can get a fair share of the food dollar? When you look at the future of agriculture, Students have an opportunity to thrive in agriculture wherever their home is or wherever they want to be. So if that's research, if that's artificial intelligence, if that's coding or drones, but also if it's traditional ag or if it's marketing, there are careers for agriculture within that entire space. And that's why the next gen investments are so exciting because we're investing in the future that's right here at VSU. Oh, that's incredible. Secretary Vilsack would be so proud of how you laid out that whiteboard speech that he has taken across the country, which makes so much sense because it's everyone at the table involved. And I think that that's what's so great about it. Um, and certainly at Virginia State University, the, the, the farmers, the rural communities, even the urban communities that we work with, um, they need to have a, a fair chance to succeed. And I think there's that opportunity. And certainly you will raise up these things as you continue on the next leg of your tour to North Carolina A&T State University. I know you have others uh, that you, you plan to engage with. And I think giving the students an opportunity to, to ask you questions and learn a little bit more about you is so incredible. So, so we're really excited about you kicking the tour off from the Virginia State University. Um, let me... Let me ask you this. So you have spent uh, two days here at Virginia State and you've you've toured our research facilities. You've been to our Randolph Farm. Um, you've seen our new research building. All the while, people are taking pictures of you. There, uh, There's an entourage of people that travel around with you. I can remember uh, it took a little while to get used to that, um, to have everyone watching you 
answer questions and ask questions. And, you know, for me, I, I often would see pictures that, you know, went into the press and I'm going, that was an awful angle. They got that picture at, you know, how did, and you know, there's a, there's a tendency to almost be a little bit insecure trying to get used to all that, but we all have insecurities. We all have insecurities. Um, being in such a high position, what what are some things that you feel insecure about? And I think it's just good for people to know that human side of all of us as leaders, because we all have insecurities. There's, we're not perfect, right? What what are some things that you feel a little insecure about sometimes? Oh, that's a, you're getting deep here. Uh, these are the things <laughs> folks want to know. <laughs> I think um, I, I definitely feel insecurity about my level of experience, and that's why it's been very intentional where I've said, okay, what are the strengths behind that too? Uh, because with every every fault, there's also an opportunity. Uh, it's one of the things I really learned. So be before this, I, I served as a representative for my community in, um, in Congress, and uh, I, I had two great years, and then I lost. Wow. And... It's really important for me to say that because it it was one of the most transformative points of my life to have the the best job I ever could have imagined, the job that I didn't know I wanted, but I loved to get to represent my home, and then to be fired by my home. Yeah. And coming to terms with every single moment of trying to do that job was worth it. And everything that I got to do while I was there was worth it. And I can fail and still do the next thing and take those lessons learned. You know, when when you don't win, you've got time to really reflect on what you learned and what you can do better in the future. And so I, I believe that I'm a stronger leader. I'm a better leader now because I know that failing isn't the worst part of life. Not trying is the worst part of life. Well said. And, and thank you for being honest about that because, you know, it's sometimes we really have to to face how that impacts us. And I felt the same way in the position. You know, I thought to myself, if I had only majored in agriculture when I was in college, I would have been well prepared for this job. And 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 I thought about all the things that I didn't know. And it it does. And, have, and working for such an experienced secretary like Secretary Vilsack, who just knows so many things, you know, you have to find your niche. And sometimes we pull from some of the previous failures and we just use that to to keep carrying on. So I, I really appreciate that. I was telling a student I was volunteering with yesterday, he's uh, majoring in business. And I said, if I could go back, I would major in business because now being the chief operating officer, there's that sort of, you've got to, got to know, got to do. How, how does it feel to be the, the first Latino woman in this position? Because I can imagine that carries a sense of responsibility. It did for me. Um, and and you know you feel a, a different weight of the job. What does that mean to you? Yeah, originally it was was really hard to to speak to that point because I didn't feel like there are just so many incredible Latinas who I have learned from, who have more experience in ag, who have been farmers, who have been uh, farm workers, and thinking that you know why am I here as the first? Uh, but that's also why it needs to be said, because I would not be here were it not for those women. I would not be there were it not for you and the path that you have forged as deputy secretary. And knowing that is incredibly humbling. It's a, a, it's a, a challenge to be the best that I can and to make sure that I may be the first, but I will not be the last. Absolutely. And, and I think about uh, us and our roles, you know, I don't know if there's a, a, a path that you can plan for these types of, of jobs, but I would imagine there's, there's someone in the audience, one of the students thinking, you know, if I wanted, if I wanted a, a job like that, if I wanted to work in a leadership role at USDA or my own company or wanting to be a leader of some sort, thinking about the federal government, um, what, do you, what kind of experience do you feel like someone should have to be a deputy secretary? Well, I love what you said about there is no one path. I, I love that you said that, you know, there's no way to be completely prepared for this. And I also feel like every experience can prepare you for this. Uh, 
who would have thought that if I'm looking back at my career, the thing that I think most prepared me was was not getting a job, was failing re-election, right? Um, but, but there are some things that are important. So being able to take any job that you step into and, and perform well, I think is really important. Learn wherever you're at. Um, if you're interested in federal service, it can be a challenge to, to get into the system. So that's one of the reasons why uh, through the next generation uh, investments, the next gen investments, President Biden is really working to get a pipeline of students into federal government. So if you have an internship with federal government or you're, you're participating in the next gen program, uh, looking at usajobs.gov and getting familiar with it, setting up your account and uploading your resume, all those things are really crucial to, to be ready when that job that you're interested in comes up. One of the things people don't always think about is that those job windows are very short. Uh, and there's sometimes a couple of days. So you want to set up a recurring notification so you can see when they come up, start to get a sense of what's going to be out there so that you're ready to apply when the time is right. But there's really no one path. And, and that's what I want to reinforce both when it comes to uh, what the future of ag looks like. There are so many, find what you enjoy mm -hmm. and then find a way to, to, to build experience through that. That's so well said. I think about us. I, I'm I was a high school teacher. I come from an education background in state government. You are a, a lawyer um, and have come through uh, your experience working in Congress and, and, and I think foreign service background and for your undergrad from Georgetown. Um, so we're completely different, right? Landed in the same job, um, but we made our way. You yeah. <laughs> One thing I always, um, always like to say, I know uh, the generations who are, are coming through college and entering the workforce want to be at the top tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I always say bloom where you're planted mm -hmm. because if you can be successful right at the spot where you are, the next opportunity is going to come and you just never know where it's going to be. And on top of that, I think I wholly agree. Bloom where you're planted. My first job was not the job I wanted my whole life. What was your first job? Uh, well, and my first job was serving frozen yogurt at TCBY when I was 16. Yeah. <laughs> I was at McDonald's. All right. right. Okay. So I do serve in the same way. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but I, th I think the, the empowering and, it, frankly, for me, inspiring thing about youth today is how they are driving policy. It might not be in the job space, but uh, the work that the Biden-Harris administration is doing now in terms of climate change, in terms of jobs, has been driven by uh, folks who are looking at their future and saying, I want a better future. And so these historic investments that we're seeing in the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, because uh, youth have demanded it. People are saying, we, we need to fight climate change. We need to create more jobs. So it, it's exciting to see those investments at USDA, but the, the proof will be in how that money is spent. And that is what is ahead of us. When you look at rural electrification, for example, so all the way back to depression FDR, mm -hmm. when, when co Congress decided no matter where in the country you live, you should be able to turn on a light switch. That bill was passed in 1936, but it wasn't until the 50s that 90% of farms had electricity. Wow. So when you look at the investment that you have driven today with the Inflation Reduction Act, mm -hmm. these next years are going to be crucial in making sure that it truly is going to fight climate change. And so that's, that, that makes me exciting about this work to come in the future. Great point. So, so young people keep pushing us because, as you said, um, the, the young folks who are leading, becoming the next leaders, they demand change and they hold us accountable. And so uh, we need to continue to be held accountable for, for uh, making sure that we protect their lives and their futures into the next 50, 100 years. I've got two more questions. Um, what's, a, what's a really cool book that I, I know you haven't had a lot of time to read a book lately, but Recently, fairly re recently, what's a really cool book that you've read in the last several years? Well, I'm I'm um, embarrassed to say this at a university, but these days, most of the books I read are books that I listen to. Does that count? That, yeah, one hundred percent count. So um, I, I was given this book that I love, and so then I downloaded it so I can listen to it. Um, Recoding America. Cool. And Catherine Ferguson gave me this book. She's the chief of staff for USDA. Yes. And it was written or written by a woman who served in the Obama administration. 
and and realized that every investment that is made takes a system to deliver. And that's the administration. Mm -hmm. It takes a computer system. It takes people who are trained in a certain way. It takes contracts that are that are written in a certain way to hold contractors accountable. And she goes through all these lessons learned and thinks about how we can improve that in the federal government. Uh, so it's a it was a great book for me stepping into deputy secretary because now I'm I'm in charge of those systems for the Department of Agriculture. Awesome. I'm a I'm a big I'll read any book that tells me how to save a dollar. Yeah, here we go. I'm always trying to figure out the best way to save another dollar. So, you know, we have our span of things, but that's really interesting and appropriate for your position as, as COO. So you're the fourth deputy secretary under Secretary Vilsack's administration who's been to Virginia State University. Uh, Kathleen Merrigan, know your farmer, know your food. She, she branded that. Um, Krista Harden. Uh, who was such an advocate for women in leadership. Uh, she got me to the White House for the very first time after coming to Virginia State uh, University several years ago. Um, I, I think I helped shed light on a lot of diversity issues at USDA during my time there. Um, I have known you to really focus on a lot of things internally at USDA that need to be fixed in order for folks to be able to benefit from USDA programs. I know that was one of the things that you were really passionate about. When you actually apply for programs, why does it have to be so difficult, you know, and you've been working internally, but you have a legacy um, that you will leave at USDA. And I want to, I want to put this last uh, slide that we have, and it's it's basically a, a picture of you then beside yourself now, where you currently sit. Um, what is the legacy that you hope to leave at the end of this administration as deputy secretary that will carry on uh, in in the the book of time going forward? You know, it's um I am honored to pick up that baton from you and the work that you have done. And when I think about what the future of agriculture looks like. I think about uh, future, the next generation and how we can invest in them. And that's why these investments are so crucial. And then I also think about that small and mid-sized farmers and how do we make the programs more accessible. So when you look, when you think about equity, I think about what does that mean in terms of people who are taking on the challenges of climate change and agriculture and efficient production with local markets, right? That's the first part, next gen. Mm -hmm. But I also think about that farmer who started an application for an FSA loan and then just didn't finish it because there was way too much paperwork and you know she had work to do in the field. And as we drive down that burden, those the cumbersome processes that are all across USDA, all across federal government and across the board make it harder for support that people for people who need it most. There's real opportunity to reduce that burden. Mm -hmm. And it'll have an impact when it comes to equity. If you think about only about 36 percent of black farmers who start an application with USDA end up getting a loan. That's compared to 72 percent of white farmers. And, you know, yes, 16% of black farmers end up getting denied, but there's 48% of black farmers who just don't even finish the application. And so FSA has been doing incredibly exciting work to uh, make sure that there's the information for an application to reduce the size of the application. And uh, I, I hope to find ways to continue to support that work so that we truly are being as accessible as possible supporting the American farmer. Well, we want to thank you for that journey. Um, it's so important for all to have uh, access to USDA programs and resources and for our entire country to, to thrive economically, uh, socially, and in all ways. So thank you for your leadership at USDA as our 15th Deputy Secretary. We say thank you for your service. I thank you for being just an awesome individual and friend, and we have been so blessed with your time here at Virginia State University. So let's give our 15th USDA Deputy Secretary a round of applause.
And thank you for joining for today's podcast, Lead, Impact, and Transform. Thank you.